Welcome to the Terran Space Academy. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Patreon is live and we appreciate any support you can offer to help us prepare you for a future in the space industry. There will be links in the description and credits at the end of the video to thank those whose work has contributed to this course. Utilization of lunar resources is vital to any successful plan to colonize the solar system. The materials from the moon can be used to launch exploration missions to Venus, Mercury, Mars, Phobos and Deimos. Supplies from the moon can provide fuel for fusion propulsion, titanium and aluminum and iron for spaceship construction, as well as water, oxygen, nitrogen, methane and helium for life support, fertilizer and fuel. We can refill the tanks of starships boosted into orbit with one supply tank from the moon and not have to launch six more starships to refuel. But what other attractive colonization targets are there? Where else could we go to be free and truly have our own world? What about the moons of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune? Jupiter has 69 moons, Saturn 62, Uranus 27, and Neptune 14. Some of these moons are in radiation belts, and some are tiny, but some of them, like Ganymede, are larger than the planet Mercury. If we are going to colonize these worlds, we will need a way to send massive amounts of cargo and supplies to establish a self-sufficient colony. Is there an efficient way to move massive ships from cislunar orbit to far frontiers of our solar system? This lesson will introduce you to technologies being developed by Dr. Craig Davidson and others that will use the sun's massive solar winds and magnetic field lines to propel our colony and trade ships through space to the worlds beyond Mars. There is a vast river of energy flowing through these magnetic field lines from the Sun. If we can tap into this energy, it would solve most of our propulsion problems in the solar system. Our ships would sail this ocean of energy, not on photons like a light sail, but on the ionic currents generated by the Sun. This is a deep dive, so grab a refreshment and sit back. It is our goal to prepare you for a future in the space industry by being somewhat of a trade school to the stars. When you set out to learn new skills, there are two routes. You can and usually should go to school and finish a degree relative to your area of interest. They have degrees in space studies now, but any good foundation in science, such as physics or chemistry, should do well. One of the best doctors I've known started out as a music major. Elon Musk does not have a degree in aerospace science. He does have a bachelor's degree in physics. Almost everything else he knows is self-taught. When he decided to build rockets, he bought an excellent book on the fundamentals of rocket science and started reading. Wherever you are in your life, this is what I suggest for you. One of the books he read, and probably the most important one book for rocket science, is this one. Rocket Propulsion Elements. It is in its ninth edition. After he finished with that one, he started building stuff. No one really took him seriously at first. What does a programmer know about building rockets anyway? Now everyone listens to him. One thing he stresses is that you don't have to have a particular degree to work at his companies. What you have done is more important than your degree. This is the trade school mentality. Learn the basics of science so you can understand the principles behind the technology. Then learn what you need to know to get the job done. The future of humanity depends on what those of us alive today do over the next 30 years. Humanity is at a bottleneck event. The great silence we see as we scan the cosmos for other civilizations like ours may be because while many planets have life, few develop a technologically advanced species. On the other hand, it could be because most of the civilizations that arise rapidly destroy themselves. We may find when we get out to the stars that a vast majority of planets have plant and animal life, but no living intelligent species, just empty abandoned cities. For Earth, our species has already survived several bottlenecks. I am lucky that some of my family's ancestry has been traced. On both my mother's and father's sides, we go back to people from Asia adventurous enough to come from the continent they knew across a land bridge into a new world of massive creatures and try to survive. What drove them? It turns out that pretty much every branch of humanity at that time were hunter-gatherers. 
We like to think that our ancestors were more in tune to the land, but that is a myth. As humans spread out into the world from the cradle of our evolution, they rapidly depleted available food sources. They needed to keep moving so the land could recover and they could survive. Hunter-gatherer lifestyle is very healthy, but requires a lot of natural resources. Once humanity had spread all around the earth, this way of life was doomed. If all humans still lived as hunter-gatherers, the earth could only sustain about a hundred million people. Our ancestors had to change their way of life to give their children a chance of survival. They developed agriculture, built cities, domesticated animals, created industries, and harnessed energy. We are all the descendants of brave people who struggled so their children would have a chance to live. This is our time. If humanity stays on Earth, our civilization is doomed to eventual extinction. We must spread out into the solar system to give our children the opportunities our ancestors gave us. The Earth has reached its limit of unsustainable human expansion. We must develop new technologies of recycling, resource utilization, and energy production. When a colony can live comfortably and sustainably on a large rock in the asteroid belt, those back home will be able to use the same technology to live sustainably on the Earth. As humanity's children expand, they must have somewhere to go. New frontiers. Most everyone today is looking to the industrial cities we will build on the Moon, the terraforming of Mars, the cloud cities we will build on Venus. These things are all in our near future. But the true frontier will be further out. The moons of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune will one day be the home of billions of people if we succeed. But to colonize these moons and travel these insane distances, we need new technologies. The concept of sailing is very old. Our ancestors built wooden ships and learned to use the movements of Earth's atmosphere for propulsion. The sun heats one side of the Earth. The atmosphere there expands and causes wind. As the Earth rotates, this area of expanding atmosphere rotates around the globe. Even planets that are tidally locked with one side facing their sun will have winds. The denser cold air will be pushed along the surface until it reaches the heated side, where the heated gases will climb to higher altitudes, creating winds of hot atmosphere streaming toward the cold side. For our ancestors, this was a very successful way to navigate the world, and we have found artifacts of distant civilizations from all over the Earth in places that are hard to explain by slow land travel. Some adventurers traveled far indeed, using these winds to colonize islands and land masses all over the Earth. Sailing in space on the sun's energy has been a concept for at least a hundred years. The Planetary Society recently launched a satellite with a giant sail that would turn its large sail away from the sun as it came toward the photon source and toward the sun on the other side, allowing the photons streaming from our star to add their momentum to the spacecrafts and increase their velocity. The experiment has worked in that the satellite has been able to maintain its orbit much longer than it could have without this sail. But this is a very slow way to travel. Photons don't have that much energy, and it is doubtful that human beings are going to be this patient. If we are going to move our family to Triton to build a new life, we don't want to burn up a big piece of our lifespan getting there. Is there another way? If you put iron filings around a magnet, you will see them line up along lines of magnetic force. These are the same lines you see in the sun as coronal mass ejections form and break off from the sun. The electromagnetic field of the sun is created by the rotation of its conductive core of dense plasma, just like the Earth's magnetic field is created by its rotating core of molten metal. The moon had a molten core, but it has hardened, and the moon's rotation magnetic field is gone though some areas of it that have ferrous metals will have frozen with that ancient magnetic alignment and can still be detected today. The Sun's massive electromagnetic power stretches far out past the orbit of even Pluto. It creates a barrier of force that the distant Voyager probe has just broken through, called the heliopause. The energy required to project a field of force this far out is almost unimaginable. What if we could harness this energy? What if satellites in orbit around the Earth could ride the Earth's magnetic field lines to maintain and adjust their orbits? What if we could use conventional chemical or nuclear engines to position massive colony ships so that they can use the energy streaming from the sun along its magnetic force lines and harness that power to propel our ships out to the frontier? Our spaceships will need a lot of energy to get somewhere. 
If our ancestors had used rowboats instead of sailing ships, they would not have gotten very far. If we can capture some of the energy streaming from the sun, the way our ancestors captured the wind, we can explore much further. Dr. Craig Davidson of the University of New Mexico and other visionaries are working on exactly that. The solar wind is produced by the sun as atoms of hydrogen and helium carry away thermal energy in the form of kinetic energy. The solar winds are moving at 400 to 700 kilometers per second. If we could build a sail that could capture this energy, our ship would be carried along up to this velocity. It would accelerate at about four and a half meters per second squared up to the velocity of this current. That could get us to Mars in a week. Is it possible to design a ship that can ride this wind? The problem with most solar sails is the size. The more massive your ship, the larger a sail will have to be to be effective. Even the thinnest of materials have enough mass to limit the size of these sails. What if we could project a massive electromagnetic field sail, a force field? Our ships could generate a massive magnetic field that it projects far out into space from the ship using superconducting coils that are charged with electricity. This field will capture charged particles from the solar wind and try to hold on to them, creating a large sphere of plasma around the ship. This plasma sphere will obstruct the flow of particles streaming from the sun, just like the sail obstructs the wind on the earth. Some of the momentum of these particles will be transferred to the ship. The solar wind of charged particles will push against your magnetic sail, accelerating at up to one half g. The limit of your final velocity would be the speed of the wind pushing you, so about 400 to 700 kilometers per second. This is faster than any spacecraft has ever gone by an order of magnitude. The main problem will be stopping when you get to where you're going. From Earth's orbit to Mars in one week is great, but not if you have to wave as you head on out of the solar system unable to stop. You could, however, use the powerful magnetic fields of these outer planets. The magnetic field of Jupiter stretches 15 times the width of the Sun. Now, magnetic fields are generated by different types of planets in different ways. Earth's magnetic field is once again generated by electrical currents moving through a rotating metallic core. The Moon and Mars have cooled and their cores no longer generate strong magnetic fields. Mercury used to have a field like Earth's, but it has also cooled and is much weaker now. Venus has a very slow rotation and generates no effective magnetic field, leaving the solar wind to strip away the hydrogen that used to be in its oceans. Only an ionized layer of atmosphere protects Venus from the sun's powerful winds. Jupiter's magnetic field is not created by a spinning core, but by an outer core where conductive liquid metallic hydrogen spins. The magnetic field of Jupiter is 20,000 times as powerful as Earth and extends 5 million kilometers on average. If we could see Jupiter's magnetic field from Earth, Jupiter would appear as large as a full moon. We could use this powerful magnetic field around Jupiter to create drag and slow our spaceship so that we could go into orbit around Jupiter and establish or supply a colony on one of the moons. Some of Jupiter's moons are within the powerful radiation field created by charged particles trapped in this magnetic field. Like the Van Allen radiation belts here on Earth, these pose a hazard to space travelers. This massive magnetic field collects particles from the Sun, from the volcanoes of Io, and from galactic radiation to create a torus of plasma that rotates with the same angular velocity and direction as the planet does. Despite Jupiter's massive size, it has a radius of over 71,000 kilometers compared to the Earth's 6,300 kilometers, and its incredible mass. Jupiter rotates in only a little less than 10 Earth hours. The Earth spins at the equator at about 1,600 kilometers per hour. Jupiter spins at a little less than 45,000 kilometers per hour. This creates huge hurricanes on its surface and causes the magnetic field to sweep through space at the same rate close to the planet. Further out, there's a whirlpool-like effect. Jupiter's massive magnetic field is loaded with ions from all over. Sulfur and oxygen from Io, hydrogen and helium from the Sun. We could use this field to slow down, but we will need lots of radiation shielding if we get too close to Jupiter. The moons of Jupiter have lots of resources, but Io and Europa are inside this massive radiation field, while Ganymede, the largest moon in our solar system, has its own protective magnetic field that blocks radiation in its equatorial region. It has an iron core, a thin oxygen atmosphere, and more water than all the oceans of Earth combined. This is a prime colonization site. 
Callisto is much further out from Jupiter than Ganymede, and the radiation is much less, even without its own magnetic shield. These are both great colony sites. Saturn generates a weaker field in the same way as Jupiter does, but it is sufficient to help stop our ships. The magnetic field of Uranus does not line up with the rotation of the planet. It is off by almost 60 degrees. Because of this, Uranus has two magnetic poles in some places and four in others. The magnetic field of Uranus is believed to be caused by the rotation of a salty ocean near the core. Neptune's magnetic field is also offset from the axis of rotation is believed to also be caused by electrical currents running through a rotating salty ocean closer to the surface of the planet than the core. No matter the source, we can use these planets' magnetic fields to slow down so we can go into orbit without using massive amounts of propellant. This will allow us to land on the moons of these planets and found our colonies. We can accomplish this by putting superconducting coils around the exterior of our ships using superconducting wires. You can see these here from Dr. Davidson's laboratory. Charging these coils will produce very powerful magnetic sails. We can use a counterfield like the one described in our course on force fields or metamaterials to protect the ship and colonists from this powerful magnetic field. Metamaterials are unique structures that, because of their carefully constructed design, cause electromagnetic energy to be redirected. These metamaterials work on magnetic fields and other types of electromagnetic radiation the way lenses work on visible light. Light can be diffracted or shifted by a lens. Fiber optic cables can cause photons to travel around curves. Metamaterials are composite materials whose internal microstructure causes them to have properties normal materials do not. Engineering the arrangement of nano or even macro scale unit cells into a desired geometry can allow us to control the refractive index of the electromagnetic energy impacting the material. Many materials have a positive refraction, but only metamaterials can have a negative refraction. These materials were only produced since the early 2000s and have already been used to reduce the noise and boost the signal in MRI machines, allowing clearer images without increasing the power of the magnetic field. If we can use these advanced technologies to produce and control efficient, powerful magnetic sails, we can open a massive sail that carries large colony and cargo ships rapidly to the new frontier, propelling us to new worlds and allowing us to continue the adventure our ancestors started and leave our descendants a better world. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe and stay safe.